Well, hello everyone, and thank you for logging in today for what, another exciting webinar, live webinar with Dr. McDougall. I'm Gustavo Tolosa, and I am the webinar host, and I am in Dallas, Texas, and I see people logging in as usually from all over the country and all over the world. Thank you for joining us. And um, today is the last webinar of 2016. Can you believe that? We've been together for two years. And I think we've missed maybe a couple of times only. So we've been here for you and it's been great. And I see that there are a lot of new people that log in every week. So that's wonderful. And so today for the last webinar of the year, I just want to uh, uh, just uh, tell you a little bit about Dr. McDougall in case that you haven't uh, you know, read a lot about him. And uh, he is the founder and director of the renowned McDougall program, which is a 10-day uh, residential program that he and his wife, Mary McDougall, host in Santa Rosa, California. And I have had the pleasure to attend it several times, and it's uh, wonderful. And uh, he is a certified, um, he's certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine and also by the National Board of Medical Examiners. And he's the author of many, and I mean many, uh, books that have been on the uh, list of bestsellers. And of course, his last book is The Healthiest Diet on the Planet which you can get in Amazon on, on Dr. McDougall's website at drmcdougall.com. And um, I just want to take one more minute, Dr. McDougall, please, because I have been doing these webinars with you two years, and I personally and everybody else who's logging in here want to thank you. I know that everybody is very grateful for you because you take time every week and um, you do this uh, for free. And I know a lot of doctors uh, that, you know, that have written books and are very well known, but I don't see them doing webinars every week. And I know that these webinars cost some money. I mean, they cost money because we, it requires equipment and subscriptions to programs and other things. And um, you just have a passion for helping people. Like I have never really met anybody with this kind of uh, passion for, for helping people get well. And so we all want to thank you. And then I want to um, encourage people to write uh, anything here on the live chat and to um, anything they want to say in, the, in, a, in words of, of gratefulness. Thank you again. And I won't take any more of your time because today we have a wonderful topic, which is arthritis. And I know we could do three or four webinars on this topic, but we're going to cram it all in in one hour. So how are you doing today in Santa Rosa, California? I'm doing fine. You know, thank you for your kind words. But see, you you folks can't feel what I feel. And I just have to let you know, I look forward to this webinar every Thursday <clears throat> and every opportunity I have to share with people. Not only do I have fun as an entertainer, which I do, and anybody who's an entertainer realizes uh, how much pleasure you get from people listening to you. But I also have a tremendous amount of reward being a physician who helps people. And I get uh, emails from folks you know, every day about uh, incurable conditions, uh, debilitating conditions that they suffer from, where a change in diet uh, improved their overall state of well-being, or in many cases, they can say they are cured of their disease and they function at a level similar to somebody else their age or better, and simply through stopping the food poisons. Uh, <clears throat> that's why it's free, and that's why it cuts your food bill by 40%. And the reason I do this is not only do I have to make a living to support, you know, Mary and the, you know, help the grandkids out, the kids out, and so on, but uh, I really love it. I really love talking to people and sharing a message. And <clears throat> we've been doing a series now for almost six months based upon a book that I wrote in 1985, which is uh, more than 30 years ago. It's uh, called The McDougall's Medicine, A Challenging Second Opinion. And when I uh, wrote this book, I was working at the Honolulu Medical Group in uh, Hawaii. It's still a, probably the most famous medical group or second most famous medical group in Honolulu. And I brought it to my peers. I remember we had a, a meeting together, the experts in cardiology and rheumatology. I mean, this is a big medical group. So they had board certified specialists in all areas. 
And so we sat down together in a room at a table. And I handed them out each individually beforehand, the chapters that included cancer, osteoporosis, heart disease, arthritis, uh, kidney disease, uh, diabetes, hypertension, and so on. <clears throat> you know, these were the cardiologists, the oncologist, rheumatologist, nephrologist, et cetera, that I gave these chapters out to, and I asked him to read them. I mean, I was working at the Honolulu Medical Group at that time. I asked him to read the chapters and to offer me criticism and tell me where I was wrong, you know, where I had incorrectly or uh, cited or stated the scientific research and the outcomes, or I had exaggerated anything, and I expected some constructive criticism. But where I got it was contempt. They were uh, very upset for me for betraying the medical business. That was the only outcome of that meeting, is I betrayed my colleagues by explaining in this book a challenging second opinion in McDougall's Medicine, by explaining that <clears throat> what was being done, plain and simple, didn't work, and these diseases had a dietary foundation, and that the scientific research clearly, and does to this day, clearly states that these diseases have an underlying cause of malnutrition due to overnutrition of people around the world now eating diets of kings and queens. And as a result of this burden of all the meat and dairy and oil and junk food, what happens is people are sickened. And I explained in this book with you know, hundreds, if not more than a thousand scientific references, I had never counted them up, why this was the case and uh, why the scientific research showed that this was the case. And as I say, what I got was contempt and betrayal from my colleagues. Well, I read this book even, you know, every week I read it in preparation for our uh, lectures. And I have to say, you know, I was a very dedicated young doctor back then. And I realized my passion, my passion remains today at nearly 70 years of age. But, you know, back then I was in my peak of my years. And all I did, you know, except for paying attention to Mary and the kids and windsurfing. Uh, and by the way, uh, the ocean was seven minutes from my garage to me moving on the water in Kailua Bay. All I did was I read scientific research. And uh, I put this book together and I read it today and I go, my goodness, I can't believe, I can't believe that I reported all these things more than 30 years ago, and they're still ignored. Well, I can believe it, and I will know why they're ignored. It's because all of these treatments are cost-free, highly effective, uh, self-prescribed, get you out of the medical business. Uh, they are totally against where uh, the advertising dollar goes. Again, I've told you many times, this is not a conspiracy. It's not try somebody trying out to go out and hurt you. It's just businesses doing what businesses do, which is make money. And they make profits. They make the shareholders happy, et cetera. And so what they're doing is they're selling their products, which are drugs, devices, surgeries, hospitalizations, and so on. And so <clears throat> that's why this information is uh, valueless in terms of uh, the usual behaviors of human beings, and that is to seek money and profit. It's just human nature. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, I dream someday, someday somebody, some medical school, uh, maybe all medical schools will require that this book be uh, uh, the foundation of all of their subject material. And then once you know the basic material, which was published before 1980, when the drug and food companies took over the medical journals and took over the scientists. See, back then, uh, before 1980, uh, research was funded by the U.S. government. And then the U.S. government cut way back on their funding for university researchers. And so these researchers had to look for funding sources. And where they looked, they found, and that was industry. And the research since 1980 is uh, uh, not just contestable, it's dishonest. Uh, about 70% of the research on drugs, or more than 70%, estimates are by Marion Nessel, PhD, <clears throat> who's a very uh, political and political writer and also a friend of mine. Estimates are as much as 90% of the research is paid for by the drug and the pharmaceutical industries. So you plain and simple don't have a chance. Your doctors could have a chance if they cared, but unfortunately the system is uh, made up so you make money by, uh, by doing more. It's uh, a system where uh, it's fee for service. The more service you provide, the more money you make. 
And so there's an incentive for doctors to do more. And that's why they do it, you know, because that's how they make their living. You know, let's not be unrealistic. That's the way it is. <clears throat> but anyways, we've been reviewing this book now for, oh, I probably eight past seminars, and we're coming to the last uh, discussion, which is on arthritis. It's not actually the last chapter in the book, but we got a little bit out of order. And if you want to go through the book, uh, it's you can probably get it for 25 cents or 50 cents at a used bookstore, or you can download it, load it from my website as a PDF, uh, very inexpensive. Uh, if you want to go through the book and read it and then listen to the webinars that uh, Gustavo and I have done over the last, uh, well, it's probably been more than eight weeks, but over our last series, then you can hear what I have to say in general about these conditions and the updated research that's been presented since uh, my publication, which is almost none. Uh, the basic research was all done before the 1980s. Then I would encourage you to do it, or make it a self-study, particularly if you're in uh, uh, businesses uh, such as uh, being a doctor, a dietitian, or in uh, other service industries to patients. Uh, and they can be very diverse, or you're just concerned about having a good education about health in the medical business in case you get into trouble. I, I would uh, offer you the opportunity to read and to listen to the lectures. So anyway, let's just talk about arthritis for a little bit. Arthritis, uh, essentially it means inflammation of the joints. <clears throat> and this can happen from all kinds of reasons. You can get arthritis from uh, spraining your ankle, from tripping, and then you have inflammation of the ankle joint and that's arthritis, it uh, is post-injury arthritis. You can get arthritis from infections that directly infect the joints with bacteria or viruses or indirectly cause autoimmune reactions that uh, affect the joints. Uh, arthritis occurs uh, secondary to eating too much rich food, primarily the purine part of the food, which is uh, the DNA and RNA, uh, which is uh, basic cellular material. The purines uh, from DNA and RNA break down into uric acid which uh, deposits in the joints and also in the kidneys to form kidney stones, but deposits in the joints and causes gout, the traditional diet of kings and queens. Uh, you can also get arthritis from autoimmune reactions, uh, which are the inflammatory arthritis, which include rheumatoid, psoriatic, uh, lupus, nonspecific arthritis. Uh, those are a few of the common uh, inflammatory autoimmune immune complex uh, arthritis. And these are uh, dietarily caused. Both the gout is clearly caused by um, what we eat and also the um, autoimmune diseases are caused by what we eat. I put it, I'll tell you what started all this for me. <clears throat> I was in my medical residency and uh, that's where I developed a passion for learning about uh, dietary diseases. It was after I was a plantation doctor and then I went into my residency. And I got a brochure, and you can find this in the book, uh, from the Arthritis Foundation. It's called The Truth About Diet and Arthritis. This was sent to myself and all other physicians across the country. It uh, is called The Truth About Diet and Arthritis. And The Truth About Diet and Arthritis may surprise you. It is simply this. There is no, with a capital N-O, special diet for arthritis. No specific food has anything to do with causing it, and no specific diet will cure it. And even the gout, they attributed gout to inheritance, not to the rich food of kings and queens. So anyway, I received this brochure. It was blue in color, and I reprinted it in the book for you. If a doctor were to get such a brochure, he or she would assume the Arthritis Foundation had thoroughly investigated the, uh, the connection between food and arthritis and would have thousands of studies, or maybe hundreds of studies, or maybe a dozen studies to support their point of view. Well, in my residency, I had access to the Hawaii Medical Library, and I went to the medical library to look up the supportive data that would cause such a brochure to be generated. A brochure, by the way, would just stop all conversation between patient and doctor about diet and arthritis, or all interest in a doctor might have in investigating the association between diet and arthritis. After all, the Arthritis Foundation came out with a clear statement. Well, you know, when I investigated in the library for research to support their claims, I found no, no research to support the claims. In fact, all the research to date had clearly said that gout, which all of you know, the disease of kings and queens is caused by 
eating all that rich food, lobster and meat and so on, uh, clearly said that and said the gout was uh, essentially 100% curable by switching to the kind of diet I recommend. And it also clearly said that uh, inflammatory arthritis, such as rheumatoid, lupus, psoriatic arthritis, nonspecific arthritis, are caused by the foods we eat. And I assembled a, a large collection. In fact, it was not large, it was 28 studies, which are published on my website that clearly showed uh, this information published in the major scientific journals, contradicting what the Arthritis Foundation said. So that's how I got inspired to uh, study and also to treat people with um, diet as the primary uh, focus of arthritis. And uh, I wrote the May 2014 newsletter where I listed 10 severe cases of rheumatoid arthritis and their testimonies about how their life was before they changed to the McDougall diet and how essentially all of them were cured by uh, making this dietary change. No cost, uh, no side effects, just by changing their diet away from the cause of the disease, which is the rest rest or diet. So that's my May 2014 newsletter. Uh, there's another condition I want to mention before I go on, and that's osteoarthritis, which is the wear and tear arthritis that people get. Uh, it, when you look at your hands, for example, your feet and the joints are crooked, and you've got big nodules at uh, the distal phalangeal joint. Uh, these are Heberdeen's nodes that are caused. And you have these deformed and enlarged joints, and they call it wear and tear arthritis or osteoarthritis. Uh, this is considered a normal part of life. As you get older, your joints are supposed to fall apart, as is your heart. <laughs> I mean, everything's supposed to fall apart as you get older. And clearly, clearly things do change. But my belief is you're to enjoy life in every decade at uh, a level of, uh, of happiness and function. So uh, it contradicts my, my basic belief that this is an, a natural part of, of uh, aging. I don't believe the body was intended to live 85 years uh, without being able to function and feel good. I, I just don't think our creator or nature or whatever you want to cause it would be uh, so cruel as to, divine, to, to design a species, an animal that was destined to suffer so much, say, after the age of 30, but certainly after the age of 50 or 70. Uh, actually, uh, osteoarthritis is very rare, or was, we always have to talk before 1980 when the West Western diet was uh, popularized in China and India and so on. So you have to look at uh, research that before, done before 1980, and it clearly showed that osteoarthritis, wear and tear arthritis was virtually unknown in Africa, Japan, China, and so on. And these are people that lived into their 80s and 90s. 10% of the African population one studied was over the age of 60. But they could find no degenerative arthritis in people who toiled in the fields and carried heavy, heavy weights on their back and their heads. Uh, no degenerative arthritis in these people, even in the old age. Whereas you looked at uh, people from the United States who did such toil as sewing with their hands or you know, washing dishes uh, and their joints fell apart as they aged. In fact, after the age of 35, uh, nearly half the people have evidence of degenerative arthritis, at least in their lower extremities. And we get past the age of uh, say 50, about 85% of people have demonstrable degenerative arthritis in the United States. Now, you know, wear and tear is real but the body is designed for wear and tear, and it has reparative capacities that uh, uh, are highly effective in keeping the rest of the body, including the joints, functional. However, when you eat the rich Western diet, you are so burdened. Your immune system, your vascular system, et cetera, are so burdened that the body cannot heal the injury. And so injury outpaces uh, healing, and the joints degenerate into osteoporosis. Now there is evidence, and I cite it in the book, that uh, when you stop repetitive injuries that osteoarthritis can heal somewhat. And I'll tell you my experience is about half the people I take care of with degenerative osteoarthritis, uh, they will tell me that they feel much better or are pain-free, particularly in those who have degenerative arthritis of the lower extremities, the hips, knees, and ankles. It's obvious that if you lose 50 or 100 pounds, your arthritis is going to be better in the lower extremities. But it goes further than that. It goes further to actual reparative processes that occur in joints that have been damaged. Now, 
the joints won't straighten out completely. Uh, they won't straighten out at all, actually. The, the damage done is the damage done, but you can stop or slow the progression of degenerative arthritis. Now, getting back to inflammatory arthritis, if you look at my May 2014 newsletter, you will see 10 people with severe rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, nonspecific arthritis, who were debilitated to the point where they couldn't pick up their children. They couldn't do basic tasks of buttoning their shirts or uh, doing any kind of uh, labor other than getting themselves up, and sometimes not even in that case, who changed their diet, who were completely cured of their affliction. Uh, it works. It works nearly 100% of the time. Uh, benefits begin in about four to seven days after you change your diet because you have to clear the foods from the bowel. And once you clear the foods from the bowel, then the body uh, is not producing the uh, underlying mechanism for this inflammatory arthritis, which I'll talk to you about in a second. And uh, the healing then outstrips the damage. Uh, the way you get these inflammatory arthritis is, is animal proteins, uh, basically meat and dairy, but dairy would be number one, you know, eggs would be, I say, number two, and then pork and beef and chicken and so on would follow. Uh, very, 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 very rarely would it be a plant protein. Well, anyway, the animal proteins, they leak through the gut wall. They're not supposed to do that but they do leak through the gut wall intact when people develop a leaky gut, which is often due to what they eat. And these animal proteins go into the bloodstream and the body perceives these as foreign proteins. The body says, you know, a cow is not supposed to be floating around in my bloodstream. So it makes antibody to the cow protein. The uh, lymphocytes make antibodies, just like it would make an antibody to a virus that got into your bloodstream to kill the virus. So it makes antibodies to this animal protein, but these antibodies are not specific to just the cow protein, say dairy or pork or beef or so on protein, but these antibodies also find similar structures in your joints, in your kidneys, in your pancreas, in your skin, etc. They also find similar proteins and these antibodies directed at the foreign cow milk based or cow meat based or pork meat based protein go and they attack our own tissues. And as a result, they cause uh, severe inflammation and deformity. The process, if you want to look it up, is called molecular, molecular mimicry. You know, uh, mimicry means copy. It finds a copy of what it's trying to attack, the food protein, on our own body tissues. And if you look up molecular mimicry on the internet, you'll be loaded with information. And then you look up, say, uh, dairy protein in molecular mimicry, or kidney disease in molecular mimicry, and so on. You'll find all kinds of research. The other way that this happens is these uh, foreign proteins get in the bloodstream. The body makes antibodies to the foreign proteins, which form large complexes of antibody and the foreign protein, which is called antigen. So you have ant these antigen antibody complexes, and they float around the bloodstream and they get caught in the various small vessels, such as the tiny vessels that supply the capillaries to the bone next to the cartilage. And they get trapped, and as a result, they cause inflammation, and they also deprive the tissues of oxygen. And another way the tissues are deprived of oxygen is by eating the high-fat Western diet, which after one meal reduces the oxygen tension by 20%. We've talked about that in various uh, previous lectures. So as a result, the foods we eat through uh, several well recognized mechanisms cause these inflammatory arthritis. Now, as a last statement, I probably have much, much more to say to you, and I do, but all the science is there. I've documented it for you. You can look up the original studies. It's not like this is something hidden or you're going to go out and you're going to find somebody that has taken the trouble of disproving all of this. As a last testament, I'll give a case example is, you know, I'll be 70 years old in a few months. There's, there's not a bit of pain or deformity in these joints, and I've used them hard, uh, sailing sailboats, windsurfing, working, et cetera. There's not a bit of damage. Mary can show you the same thing at 70 years of age. I think that's good. But let me tell you something else. Remember, at age 18, I had a massive stroke, 
And as a result, I've been lopsided for 51 years. And you would expect that <clears throat> mechanical dysfunction that I've had affecting my left side of my body would have resulted in severe wear and tear on my ankles, knees, hips, shoulder, elbows, and so on on the left side. I can tell you the left side of my body is absolutely symptom-free and actually better off than the right side of my body, which occasionally has aches and pains. So, uh, you know, it's the food, folks. Just like everything else, it's the food that's fundamental. And uh, there are secondary factors after that, and there are other causes of disease besides uh, food, but you know, you can't do anything about viral infections. There's nothing that can be done. And you can't do anything about your heredity. You're stuck with your genes from your mom and dad. So why don't you deal with something that you have 100% control over, which affects all aspects of your health and your economy and your productiveness and planet Earth that we've talked about. Why don't you, why don't you look at that first? And uh, you will find cure for many kinds of arthritis, gout particularly, and inflammatory arthritis, i.e. rheumatoid, psoriatic, lupus, nonspecific arthritis. Uh, look to your diet. Gout is 100% curable. Gout cannot exist on the type of diet I recommend. Uh, it was unknown before 1980 in parts of the world that I described, like China, Vietnam, Cambodia, Japan, rural Africa, rural India. It was unknown. But in the wealthy class, uh, these uh, were common diseases which have become epidemic, just like in the United States. Uh, <clears throat> so that's, uh, that's my, my pitch for you on arthritis. And I'd be glad to take questions. Uh, next week, we're going to have another, uh, another webinar where you and I get time to spend together. And right now, I'm in the process of writing a tribute to uh, one of the most important men in my life. His name is, was Henry Heimlich. He died uh, December 17th, 2016, at age 96. <clears throat> and I'll be writing a tribute to this man who was a big influence on me uh, in uh, the newsletter that comes out in about three days. And we'll discuss this a bit in the next month's newsletter. But uh, if you're not familiar with Henry Heimlich, you may want to read about him uh, on the internet. You all know about the Heimlich Maneuver. This man, through the Heimlich Maneuver for choking, and for drowning, as well as something called the Heimlich chest valve, which is used in, uh, particularly in war situations where uh, men, primarily men, get uh, traumatic uh, chest injuries. And it is a life-saving procedure uh, based upon a fart valve, <laughs> or uh, let's see, uh, that's not what it's called exactly. It's a fart whistler. It's something my little kids have, my grandkids, it's, it's this thing, with a tube and a rubber flapper at the end, and you blow on it, it makes a farting sound. Well, Henry Heimlich took that basic fart whistle, put it in a sterilized environment in casing. And what happens is that when a, when a war victim with a chest injury gets injured on the battlefield, his chest wound can be closed in various ways. And then this Heimlich chest valve can be inserted. And what happens with every breath is air is exhaled out of the fart whistle <laughs> and it can't get back in and you can reinflate the chest on the battlefield and it says saved, uh, well, it saved uh, hundreds of thousands of lives in Vietnam particularly. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> we'll be talking about that next week. So with that introduction and a great thank you for participating with Dr. Uh, Dr. Colosa and myself uh, this past year in our webinars. Uh, now it, it's been 2016 has been a great year and I'm very opt optimistic for 2017. And actually I'm so optimistic I have to tell you Gustavo, uh, you know Mary, as I say Mary's 70, I'm nearly 70 and we thought about quitting the McDougal adventure trips. A lot of work uh, for tremendous amount, tremendous, tremendous little profit. But it's fun. So we take people on adventures. We used to take them a lot to Costa Rica. Now we're taking them to Alaska and Hawaii, just because it's you know a safe part of the world. Well, uh, our thoughts were we'd never do another adventure trip after the Kauai trip, which is going to be the end of January 2017.
we thought, well, that'll be our last adventure trip. You know, there's a time when people should. Anyway, Mary and I feel so good and are so excited about interacting with you folks and being able to work. We're just so glad we can work every day that uh, we're right now in the process of planning two new trips for 2018. So if you missed the 2017 trip, the only one we're doing this year, which is to Kauai, then uh, think about watching uh, our announcements. And when the announcement comes out for two destinations in the US, don't hesitate, You know, sign up. Uh, we don't know what 2019 will bring, but I can tell you, Mary and I have got great plans for the next two years of having fun with you. So. All right, wow, I'm looking forward to hearing about that. Well, you're also going to Kauai with us in yes. January, so yes, that's fine. that'll be a lot of fun. And we have, oh, we have 145 people coming. Uh, wow. Oh, oh. The, di the dining room is sold out at 150. But, you know, it's so well organized, Gustavo, that, uh, and the people are so nice that they they never appreciate anything more than as a personal trip with John and Mary McDougal. So uh, we wouldn't run a trip of that size if we didn't have the staff to handle it. And Mary and I weren't prepared to spend uh, a lot of good personal time with the people that are coming on the trip. Uh, right, right. Anyway. Well, very good. Yes, I know. I'm looking forward to it. And I know all the other 140 some people are looking forward to it, too. The, the food is the best food of any venture trip we've I've ever done. i you say that. Oh, uh, yeah. At, at the Sheraton Kauai. Uh, hopefully we have the same chef as we had last year. Now, Mary and I are going to be working very, very much with uh, that chef to make sure he and his staff uh, are well prepared to take care of um, nearly 150 people, when you conclude staff and everything, it's more than 150, to take care and feed all of us uh, with phenomenal food. Yeah. Mm, okay, well, I'm going to, uh, I'm certainly going to enjoy that part. <laughs> you, need, you need to get your appetite ready. <laughs> yes, I will, for sure. All right, Dr. Maduro, are we ready for some questions? Yeah, sure. Because let's, let's we have it. many, and I know that we won't be able to cover all of them, but please be patient because I'm sure Dr. McDougall at some point we want to do maybe another arthritis, maybe do a series um, uh, because there's some. You know, you, know, you know what I was thinking is uh, it's kind of fun for me to have a topic. Yeah, I was, it is. When I talked about it, that maybe we do uh, uh, Dr. McDougall's Digestive Tune Up, the book I did on GI disease. Right, right. It's still sold in Whole Foods, it's still sold on Amazon, and you can order it in any bookstore. It's uh, the GI book I wrote. It's a fun book, and maybe we'll do that chapter by chapter, just as yes. an introduction for people. Uh, there are people who just casually listen and pick up little tits bits of uh, information and share it with friends. And then I know some of you are out there consciously trying to learn this so you can help your family, and maybe it's part of your business. Uh, you consciously want to do the best you can for people around you, because as we talked about, happiness comes from helping other folks. And there's no greater benefit that you can give other people than fixing the problem. The problem, as we mentioned, is the food. Right. So talking about food, one of the um, viewers here is asking, is, are, are, there, are there any types of arthritis that don't always respond to a whole food, plant-based uh, diet like the one you recommend that is starch-based in your experience? Well, as I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> degenerative or osteoarthritis uh, shouldn't respond because it's due to wear and tear and you see all these permanent uh, deformities in people's hands and feet. And they have, um, you know, hip disease that requires hip surgery, et cetera, shoulder disease, which requires shoulder surgery and, and so on. It shouldn't respond. Uh, but I can just tell you about half the people I take care of, they tell me that they're better or some of them completely symptom free. So uh, the uh, inflammatory arthritis is it's only rare that I run into somebody that isn't dramatically benefited within, like I say, about seven days and uh, essentially cured within about four months. But I do run into some people in that situation. And what I do for those folks is I put them on the elimination diet. And if that doesn't work, I send them off to my good friends at True North where they're locked up and they're uh, essentially fed only water. They go through a water fast. And I have to say that not too many people have um, 
experienced an additional benefit from water fasting. Uh, not, not in my experience. Now, uh, the reason I send them there is often that they need long, longer term care than we provide at our 10 day program. Plus, you know, I, I think that I may be missing something. And certainly the water fast is the ultimate elimination diet. It's the ultimate low cholesterol, low fat, low protein diet. Uh, so you'd expect if they are going to get better from a, a change in diet, that water fasting should bring that out. And there have been many, many studies, and they're cited in the references I gave you on water fasting uh, that were done. And uh, the dramatic benefit and cure of people of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, for example, the Lance is published, the Lancet, L-A-N-C-E-T, probably the most famous medical journal in the world, published a study in 1991 of people who went on a juice fast who had rheumatoid arthritis. And at the end of the week of one week, all were better. And they followed these people up for at least two years. And those who adhered to the diet, you know, after they left the juice fast, they went on a vegan diet. And those who adhered to the diet, uh, they continued to show the benefits. Those who didn't went back into their inflammatory condition. <clears throat> And there's also one other study I want to point out. And it's one where they did a water fast and they did it on patients with psoriatic arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. And then when they finished the water fast, they put them on a vegan diet, which was also high in vegetable oil. And all of those with rheumatoid arthritis had dramatic return of their inflammation. Some with the psoriatic conditions still showed improvement in their skin and their joints. But it's a point I make with the study that you can't just go on a vegan diet. You, you had has to be one with no oil, very low fat. I remember one of my uh, patients, I was actually at the Honolulu Medical Group where I talked to you about my uh, discussions with my colleagues in the, in the production of this book. I remember one of my patients uh, came to see me at the Honolulu Medical Group and uh, I taught her the diet. She, none of the drugs worked for her. So I taught her the diet. She followed the diet for four months. She was completely free of her debilitating arthritis, hands, knees, feet, and so on. And uh, one day I opened the office door, the patient office door, and walked in and saw her sitting there. And from across the room, I could see the inflammation in her knees. They were swollen and red. And I said, what happened? She said, nothing. I've been absolutely strictly adherent to the diet. Well, okay, tell me what you've done over the last four days. And she said, I've been vegan, 100% vegan. Well, tell me about your eating out experience. What do you mean? Well, tell me. She said, well, two nights ago or one night ago, I went out with my friends to a vegan Chinese restaurant. Of course, that means a Chinese restaurant with vegetables dripping in peanut oil and other oils. And uh, it was within 48 hours, probably 24 hours. She got severe inflammation. So I do have to warn you. A vegan diet is not enough. It must be a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables and low fat, especially no added vegetable oils. So cure rates on those, I would say cure rates on inflammatory arthritis is, are as common as cure rates for constipation when you follow the diet. In other words, there are very few exceptions that people don't get dramatically better and can use the word cured. Remember, there are, there are damages to the joints that are permanent, but as far as new attacks, uh, you, you should expect these results. And that's what the science says. And that's what your doctor ought to be teaching you. As I've said before, the failings of your doctor should, be, should re result in accountable action, uh, at least a complaint to the, uh, to the medical group that the doctor didn't teach you about the dietary aspects of treating your arthritis or kidney disease or heart disease if not something more severe to wake up my medical colleagues. I know you're well-meaning. I know you love your patients. I know you went a half a million dollars in debt to get your medical degree in education. But you know what? You got cheated in medical school because they didn't teach you about the fundamental cause of disease, which is food poisoning, which is obvious to anybody. Anybody, anybody who has a, a worldwide look or a historical look of the world, you know that when people switch from starch-based diets, which 99.99% of the population used to follow, to the Western diet with animals and oils, you know, you can see it yourself. I mean, it's not like I have to convince you. Just open your eyes. 
Some of you are uh, of uh, Filipino, recent Filipino, Japanese, African descent. You know, your, your relatives have uh, came from, quote, the old country. And you can remember grandma and grandpa thriving until their 80s and 90s, working hard, living on rice or corn or other types of grains and root vegetables, thriving and not drinking any milk, or eating any cheese and minimal amount of animal food intake. And you can see what happened in the next generation, your generation. Look at your cousins, look at your brothers and sisters. They're fat, diabetic, dying of cancer and heart disease. You think this, that your genes somehow did a flip flop on you in a generation or two? <laughs> All right, so anyway, you should expect that gout's 100% curable on this kind of diet. When you first change your diet with gout, however, you may get gouty attacks because uh, uric acid is so abundantly stored in the body. When you lose weight, uh, what happens is uric acid mobilizes and uh, sometimes crystallizes in the joints. So during the first six months after somebody who has a strong history of gout, after they change their diet, they're susceptible to gouty attacks from any weight loss program, not just my program, any weight loss program. Also from taking allopurinol, which is a, a gout drug. Uh, they're susceptible, susceptible to acute attacks because of the mobilization of uric acid from the tissues, which common, which can settle in the joints. So what I do with these folks is I treat them with colchicine, an old drug. I mean, it's probably been known for hundreds of years. Uh, colchicine, which used to be extremely inexpensive until a drug company recently bought the patent on it and pumped up the price to many dollars per pill, crooked. But who, you know, who's judging? Uh, <clears throat> so I put them on a half a, um, a half a milligram or six tenths of a milligram of colchicine daily for about six months while they're going through the transition process and losing the weight and mobilizing the uric acid. And, and by the way, for people with inflammatory arthritis, I keep them on their methotrexate and their biologic agents. And then as they clearly show improvement, then their doctor should be, and you should insist the doctors reduce slowly and eventually discontinue these very, very toxic and in many cases, extremely expensive, like costing thirty-five dollars to $75,000 a year for the drug, that your doctor should be reducing and eventually stopping these medications as you show obvious signs of improvement. You know, don't, you're the customer, don't take any, any of their BS about how it's gonna come back. Well, okay, so it comes back, I'll start your drugs again. Now you have to be forceful. Doctors are insistent upon uh, dispensing their tools. It's not that these things don't provide some benefit or they would be used, they relieve pain. Whether or not they slow or stop the progression of disease is highly debatable. Anyway, uh, uh, you need to get off the medications and uh, you should do it under medical supervision. Right, right. Thank you, Dr. Maduro. That, that was one of the questions I was going to ask you if you ever prescribed any medications and what they were and then how the patient got off the medication. So you just described it. Well, Perfect. they usually come on, they usually come in on drugs. So it's a matter of uh, us getting them well and then reducing the medication, usually under the direction of their rheumatologist. Uh, if your rheumatologist won't cooperate, fire them. I mean, after all, you're the customer, fire them, go see somebody else. And uh, it's your health at stake. Uh, so, so what if you hurt their feelings? Right, and, right. And, and, I'll and I'll just add one other thing since you had uh, ask about drugs. One of my favorite medications is aspirin. Plain old aspirin, I get a high quality aspirin such as Bear, uh, which dissolves easily and uh, can be dissolved before consuming it. So you drink it as opposed to taking the tablets which can sit on your stomach. Uh, again, when I was young, you know, when I had to walk to school four miles with a backpack in the snow, uh, you know those stories. When I was a, a doctor training beginning about a half a century ago, uh, we used to use aspirin because we had nothing else for treatment of uh, severe arthritis, including rheumatoid arthritis. And we give up to 16 tablets a day. We would give people our, our uh, aspirin until their ears would ring. And uh, aspirin is a very, very effective way to relieve pain and inflammation for these inflammatory arthritis. So I prefer aspirin over any other medication when symptom relief is required. Uh, 
you know, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen, et cetera, became very popular because of, of business. You know, these were patented drugs, and so they became popular, but they're much more toxic and at best as effective as aspirin in terms of relieving inflammation and pain. Uh, so I don't use these drugs as a first choice. Aspirin is the drug that I use for my patients. And then, of course, there are the cancer drugs like methotrexate and the biologics like Humira and Embril, which are commonly prescribed. Again, these drugs are costing thirty-five dollars to $75,000 a year for the patient, which I know you have insurance, so you don't have to pay for all of it. If you did, you wouldn't buy it. I'll show you that. <laughs> Uh, Dr. McDougall, would you address the um, concerns about inflammatory reactions to grains and legumes? A lot of people have this question. I know. This has, of course, become very popular and in a good way. And that is talking about uh, gluten intolerance, which results in celiac disease and dermatitis hepatiformis, which is a skin condition. Uh, this has become very popular, particularly made by two books called Wheat Belly and Grain Brain. And what they've done, instead of attributing uh, the rare case of celiac disease, which probably occurs in one in 250 people on the Western diet, certainly fewer than one in 100, they have generalized uh, this problem to include uh, basically everybody. So the now about 40% of the products, uh, packaged products in the store are labeled gluten-free and people are seeking good health by eating diets free of wheat, barley, and rye, which are high gluten-containing foods. And uh, the result is failure. Uh, they don't get better. They stay fat. They gain weight. Uh, so it, it doesn't work. I've written I've written an uh, article called something about the gluten rage. You can find it on my website, which documents all this. It's uh, also been a serious distraction from people who really do have celiac disease. When folks come in and claim that they can't tolerate wheat, barley, and rye, the waiter says, uh, okay, sure, I heard that from the last 40 people who came in, and I served them croutons on their soup, and they didn't have a reaction. So, you know, ain't no big deal. You're probably lying, or uh, I'm not going to pay attention. But for those who truly have celiac disease, consuming wheat, barley, and rye can be devastating. So it's hard for people who really do have this uh, condition. Uh, People who have celiac disease, the brush border of their gut is knocked down. Uh, they develop a leaky gut. As a result of this leaky gut, animal proteins can more easily pass intact into the bloodstream, causing these reactions I talked to you about a few minutes ago of immune complex formation, uh, complexes between antigens, food proteins, and antibodies produced by lymphocytes can uh, uh, produce these complexes when the, the animal protein easily passes the destroyed brush border of the intestinal tract, which has been destroyed by gluten. And uh, likewise, uh, you have these animal proteins resulting in molecular mimicry. So when people have, and we see these, I see these all the time at my clinic, my 10-day program, when people come in and they complain of multiple uh, autoimmune diseases, such as they have thyroiditis, uh, which is um, manifested by hypothyroidism, or they have type 1 diabetes, and or they have uh, inflammatory arthritis. When you start looking at multiple, multiple autoimmune diseases, you should consider uh, gluten intolerance problems. And I always put these people on gluten-free diets. If you come to any of our programs, our weekends or 10-day programs, you will see that the foods are labeled as being uh, gluten-free if they are, uh, so that people, and it's only rare, Rare. Maybe one person in a, every two or three programs really requires this kind of restriction. So that people who do require this restriction can easily pick the foods when they go through the program. Uh, likewise, all of the recipes and the ingredients are listed in a book that we have in the, uh, in the dining room at the program. And we don't do that on the adventure trips. You're on your own. Or we can uh, talk to the chef. Try and help you. Very good. Thank you, Dr. McTougall. I have a um, question here that someone submitted by email. And by the way, any questions that people want to submit ahead of time, they can send to webinar at drmcdougall.com. Uh, someone is asking about uh, psoriatic arthritis. And if you could say any words about that, is she says if if water intake is crucial, what 
to definitely eat and what to definitely not eat? Okay. What I talked about is I talked about a water fast, which means you do nothing but drink water in terms of treating psoriatic arthritis. But I have to tell you, the most fun patients I get to take care of are those with psoriatic arthritis because they respond so dramatically to the diet. I I remember one of my earliest patients, uh, he came into the office barely able to, it took him at least five minutes to get from my waiting room to my uh, exam room. And I examined him and I gave him the the same old pitch, you know, that I always have been given for for more than 40 years. I gave him the pitch and uh, he came in about four weeks later and he actually danced, actually danced through through the waiting room into the office. And, you know, and that's been my experience. Psoriatic arthritis is so easy and so fun to treat. In the May 2010 newsletter is, is a case of a woman with severe psoriatic arthritis. Uh, Likewise, psoriatic psoriatic lesions on the skin uh, respond dramatically to a dietary change. Uh, Most of you know that one of my heroes, one of my mentors, and uh, the person I did know personally, and I've written written about much and had a chance to uh, republicize his work. You can find a discussion of this man in my February 2013 newsletter. His name, Nathan Pritikin. Uh, I've sent out his basic research, 510 pages of a document on the review of the scientific literature. Anybody interested in science should read that. I believe it was two newsletters ago that I cited it. Easy to find. Uh, I sent out a paper. It's actually found in my February 2013 newsletter that he did on uh, uh, maligned carbohydrates, uh, misunderstood and maligned carbohydrates, which explained, this is an article written in, I think, 1978, which explained uh, the misconception people had then, that's 1978. What are we, 40 years later? Still same uh, misinformation, dishonesty going on, and even to a greater degree about how bad it is for you to eat rice and potatoes. Yet, when you look around the world, rice and potato eaters are always thin, never have heart disease, breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, et cetera. Anyway, Nathan Pritikin told me, we had some personal conversations. I was fortunate to spend a few days with him on separate occasions. And uh, as I've said, there are only two people I could ever wait to hear this, the next word coming out of their mouth. One was Nathan Pritikin, the other was Henry Heimlich. Nathan Pritikin told me one time, he said he never saw a case of psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis that didn't respond to his diet, which was essentially the diet I recommend or a case of rheumatoid arthritis that did not respond. And I kind of laughed, kind of laughed. It was a really shallow laugh, kept very deep inside, and said that it's just just way too dramatic to make 100% statements like that. You know, you've got to be criticized for doing that. And, uh, you know, that was probably 30, 35 years ago. He said that I'm still waiting for the exception. And I'm still waiting to say, Mr. Pritikin, which I always called him, Never Nathan. Mr. Prettygun, you exaggerated. He did not exaggerate. Um, he was forgotten, just like Henry Heimlich has been forgotten, that these were some of the greatest medical pioneers of the 20th century. Right. And you have been taking care of patients for over 40 years, right? Well, actually, I, you know, I started in medicine in 1968, so that makes it almost 50 <laughs> years ago. Almost. I, you know, I've been doing this kind of practice for 40 years, and I've been doing uh, living uh, patient settings almost exclusively for the last 30 years. That is, and I don't, I don't see, uh, you can't call up my office and get an appointment. I, I don't see patients uh, as a one night stand anymore. I haven't for 30 years. Instead, I really get to know my patients uh, by involving them in the 10 day program first. And then, then we really develop a clear understanding and a professional personal friendship. Right. And uh, they, they, you know, often come skeptical, but I'd have to say nearly 100% of people live, leave convinced, not only because of their dramatic results, which they see in the way they feel and in the numbers, which we published, by the way. We published uh, seven-day results on 1,615 people and results from Oregon Health and Science University and Medical School in Portland on uh, one year of uh, the McDougal dietary treatment. By the time they leave the program, most are convinced 
And we find that 85% of people based on the Oregon Health and Science University uh, research study that has been published, 85% of people remain compliant for 12 months. Yeah. So it's, it's a great experience to be able to change people's lives, but it has to be done for many people in the 10 day setting. Others, and I would say they number in the hundreds of thousands have been able to go to the website, which is free. Everything's free. Uh, <clears throat> or read the books, which I say you can buy this one for probably 50% at a used, 50, 50 cents at half a dollar at a used bookstore. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people have taken this in their own hands, which they can and should do. Right. Unless they're severely right. ill or under, or under medication, then I recommend uh, healthcare uh, observation, healthcare provider observation. Now to find healthcare providers that are competent in terms of diet and or reduction of medication after diet, they are few and far between. And in fact, almost non-existent. So if you're looking for your doctor for help, uh, don't expect it initially, but I know all of them are well-meaning. They want to help you. And many of them will be open-minded enough to at least take a look at the science and at least offer you support, if not changing their lucrative practice of seeing a patient every seven minutes which pays the bills and keeps the office doors open. So uh, I'll take the effort to help your doctor uh, get another point of view, but don't be take it personal or get disappointed if they're not interested. Our patients will come in, typically they'll tell me, I came into my doctor, I grabbed his or her hand, shook their hand and said, squeeze as hard as you want, doctor, squeeze as hard as you want. And the doctor say, my goodness, you know, you were crippled with rheumatoid arthritis last time I saw you. Doctor, do you want to know what I did? And the patient starts to talk. Doctor says, hey, whatever you did, just keep doing it. Next. <laughs> right. Oh, so sad. Uh, Dr. McDougall, um, I know we did a webinar on oil a while back. But right. um, would you just mention one more time that when you say oil, you mean uh, oil, uh, fish oil, uh, olive oil, you know, right. coconut oil. I mean, can you just say something about well, oil? Well, oil does not exist uh, freely in nature. If you're to get oil in some way, you have to process the food. You got to squeeze the fish. You got to squeeze the olive at least to get the oil out. So uh, free oil does not exist in nature. It's always complex in a food, such as a fruit like an olive, uh, which contains proteins, vitamins, minerals, other phytochemicals, which makes the oil safe. When you extract the oil from its environment, like you take the olive oil out of the olive, then you left all the other uh, important ingredients that must go into your body, into your cells, to allow that oil to uh, uh, at least not be harmful if not produce benefits. So uh, oil is toxic. It's an isolated concentrated nutrient. It is not a food. It is at best a medicine, at worst a poison, a serious toxin. It's one of the two food poisons that I uh, wrote about in the, clearly I've written about it, right? Written, and I read this old book and I, I see that what I say is a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. I've been saying it for 40 years. But the newest book, I give you two categories of food poison, and one is the vegetable oil. You know, these oils should be strictly eliminated from your diet. Uh, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. What more concentrated amount of fat that you can get than from a bottle of corn oil or a bottle of olive oil? What, how, how much more concentrated in calories can you get? The fat you eat is the fat you wear. These oils uh, promote cancer. These oils promote gallbladder disease. These oils make your skin greasy and cause uh, oily skin and acne. Uh, as I explained to you, these oils, when fed to people post-fasting, post-water fasting, in a vegan diet, uh, cause the return of their inflammatory arthritis. Uh, get them out of your diet. <clears throat> I have to reemphasize, it's, it's, it's been a focus of my personal development over 40 years, is I, I started out being a little nicer in the early years and uh, offering people uh, the best I knew, but uh, telling them that you know, whatever they accomplished uh, would be worthwhile. And I still believe that. Whatever they accomplished in terms of dietary change, this is not an all or nothing change. 
as I've learned over the years through personal experience with myself, as well as my patients, is most of us can't be moderate. You know, I quit my last cigarette October 20th at 7 a.m. in the morning, 1972. And I remain cigarette free. However, if today, this afternoon, I had one Marlboro was my favorite, one Marlboro cigarette, I'd have three tomorrow. And by the weekend, I'd be up to two packs a day. You know, I either have none or I smoke two packs a day. You know, it's the same thing with alcohol or heroin or cocaine. Or ladies and gentlemen, for most of you, it's, same, it's the same thing with chocolate cake and pepperoni pizza. You either eat none or you eat the whole darn cake or the whole large size 16 inch pepperoni pizza. You know, that's our nature, our behavior. Uh, therefore, if you want to be uh, effectively different for 2017 or 2018 or the rest of your life, you must set up a clear boundary. Today, I'm a smoker. Tomorrow, I am not. Today, I am a drunk. Tomorrow, I am not. Today, I suffer from heart disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, constipation. I am sick from poo food poisoning. Tomorrow, I will not be. In case you stop the food poisoning, which are the animal foods and oils. I'm sorry. I didn't design the human being. We are just that way. We're all or nothing. Most of us, few of us are moderate. Uh, so that's the brash, bold, <laughs> hopefully constructive attitude I take with you. But again, you know, uh, I don't claim perfection. And, uh, uh, but, but I do think it's my obligation to teach you the best. It's like, for example, if a smoker came to me <clears throat> and they said, look, doc, I don't want to get lung cancer and I don't want to get emphysema. How many cigarettes should I smoke? What can I get away with? What responsible doctor would say anything but it has to be 100%. You know, even though you may tolerate us two or three cigarettes a week, and I know people can and will. You know, it's the same thing with alcohol. Nine out of 10 people get away with it. You know, but one out of 10, it destroys their life. And you just can't have one. You've learned that. You can't have one. There's no such thing as one. <laughs> Once you cross the line, you know, I, I remember discussions about crossing the line. I clearly understand crossing the line. Once you cross the line, you are on the other side. You are not on the line. You are on the other side. And it is that way with food, too. So if you decide you want a different life, as all of our patients get when they stop the food poisoning, you can read about it in the research as well as star materials on the website. If you want life different, if you want to see your grandkids, if you want to walk to work, if you want to stop taking the pills, then um, you can't cross the line. <laughs> and every one of you who has had problems with addiction, maybe an addicted lover, an addiction to a lover or a bad wife or husband, you know darn well you can't cross the line. You've got to get them out of your life. That's okay. right. We could go on and on. Couldn't we go on and on, Gasol? <laughs> Well, that's not what we want to hear. We want to hear that we can have a little piece of cake, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? I really enjoyed smoking cigarettes. I really did. You know, you learn your habits from your parents. And you so do. that's why we talk about family diseases and hereditary diseases is because we learned to smoke. I learned to smoke from my mom and dad. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, uh, you learn how to cook and how to eat from your parents. Right. I was going to say, you know, that we do, we learn how to eat and cook from, from our family, from our parents. Uh, Dr. Mark Dougal, I wanted to ask you about, uh, so, uh, just to finish, because we're a little bit over the time, but someone was asking about when the next 10-day um, living program is, and uh, yeah. they can stop the food poisoning and start brand new in 2017. So yeah. it's, it's sold well, out. I, I, no, I don't think it's sold out. It's, it's close to being sold right. out. It would be January 6th, 2017, like right. a week from Friday. Right. Oh, boy, I, I, I tell you, that Christmas went by so fast. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know. You. It's January. I, I believe it's January 6th, and we do still have room. Anybody interested, go to drmarkdougal.com. Yeah. Oh, yeah, check the calendar. It's January 6th. Yeah. It's, oh. Okay, great. Yeah, well, there's January one, 6th. and then there's no, several we I think our next one after that is March. We run about six a year for the public. Right. 
and then we run uh, several a year for businesses. And then, of course, we have the Advanced Study Weekend, which is coming up February 10 through 12, where we have all kinds of great guests, including David Katz, who is the former president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, a very, very interesting man. Yeah, all right. And be our keynote speaker. And then we have the potato man, Andrew Taylor. Mm -hmm, right. I'm flying him over from Australia. Yeah. A whole bunch of other very, very interesting speakers. And that's the weekend. You're going to be there, of course, probably. Hopefully. I hope so. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I, I did want to mention, too, I want to thank all of you who have donated to the McDougall Research and Education Foundation this year. We received thousands of dollars to support our research as well as education for medical students. Uh, we um, take uh, two or maximum three medical students each program. Uh, and these uh, students work intensively with the patients. These are uh, uh, rotations that are accredited through the medical school. And our foundation pays for all of their expenses, including travel, to come and learn with us. And uh, so thank you for your donations to help uh, young people learn and to help their ongoing research. Right. It's a wonderful program. Well, thank you, Dr. McDougall. Thanks, and uh, I hope that you, ha you have a wonderful beginning of the new year. Thank you. Thank you, folks, for listening. It's All right. Good news. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everyone. See you next week. Bye-bye.